Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sorting Hat Podcast, the show where everything and anything can and will be sorted. I, as always, am your host, Michael Barrett, joined by my co-host, Reed Bryce. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. <laughs> uh, the basic conceit of the show is we have a fan expert or someone who is wildly knowledgeable about a subject, and then we sort things within that uh, category into the various houses of Hogwarts. Today, we are joined by Tyler Ruggie. Uh, Tyler... Thank you so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, we're so lucky to get you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> uh, for those unfamiliar, Tyler has a lot of pets. Yeah. <laughs> like I, uh, you have thirty plus pets. Yes, I do. Yeah, what's, uh, the, what's the current count at? I don't have an exact number. <laughs> that is that is when you know it's a lot. Whatever, if you're like, I'm not sure. Well, the it number is high. It depends what you <laughs> classify as pets too, because some people, you know, I don't know if. Uh, fish tanks count as like one pet each or if every fish counts. I see. That's one thing. <laughs> Some people are like tarantulas don't count as pets. You can't like do anything with them. So it just depends oh, I guess. So they're basing it off the, the actual relationship that you can have with each Some other. Some people do, yeah. Yes, I see. I also have a <laughs> colony of dubia roaches. Wow. Oh. So would you consider the entire colony one pet or do you consider them like 500 pets. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna... <laughs> I can understand how the numbering might become yeah. a little bit confusing. Uh, but today, we are going to actually uh, not be focusing on all of your pets, but yes. focusing on the reptiles which you possess. Yes. Um, what, when did you start, co- like, owning and owning reptiles and being interested in reptiles, first and foremost? Um, well, I've always been interested in reptiles. I've always really liked them and begged my parents to let me get them as a pet ever since I was a little kid. Yeah. My parents are not a fan of reptiles, or really most animals in general, which is shocking <laughs> considering who I am. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I've wanted hamsters, whatever. They just don't really like anything besides dogs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I always was interested in reptiles and then when I turned like 16 or 17 my dad finally got me a leopard gecko for my birthday and that's what started the whole thing because then I was like wow I love this a lot wow and then I started getting more (laughs) okay and so (laughs) is the leopard gecko still with you no um sad my it's ironic because my dad got me the leopard gecko but then my parents ended up not liking it because they thought it was like weird and they thought it was ugly so they asked me to like uh, we have a reptile shop mm-hmm. near us, so they asked me to just give it to the reptile shop. So it hasn't. So your reptile has not passed on. No, Th- my, they just are fostered now with another. Yeah, my parents. They had a to... conscious uncoupling, as Gwyneth Paltrow would say. <laughs> yes, the, the leopard gecko went off to do amazing things with their own power, and your family and were like, "Okay, we're gonna." Yeah, get my yeah. I, they weren't weren't a fan. I don't know why. Okay. Just didn't work out. Do you do you now own another leopard gecko? I don't. You I, don't. I love them, and I kind of want another one, but I've reached a point right now where where I am I think I should hold off on getting more <laughs> that's fair that's fair when you're at 30 I mean I have to assume most of your day is just spent walking feeding cleaning yeah taking care of these animals and I still live with my parents yeah. so the majority of them are in my bedroom <gasps> so that's another thing I physically pretty much don't have much more space for more Gotcha. So, yeah. yeah, I grew. Up, I grew up on. A, I, I grew up on a farm myself. Uh, about how long does it take you to like feed all your animals every day? Um, well, what's cool about reptiles and my, my tarantulas and some other things is they don't eat every single day. A lot of them will eat like once every three days or once a week. Oh, okay. So it's so, mostly about being able to keep keep the schedule and like yeah, and, like, figure remember, out like, when, who's eating when. Yeah. <laughs> when, 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 how many mice are there? Oh, someone has to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to like keep a keep a count like on a piece of paper or something. Make sure I mm-hmm. know who ate gotcha. when and when they need to be fed again. Okay. So out of yeah. the, all of your pets that you have right now, who who do you think's been there the longest out of all the reptiles? Out of all the reptiles, my ball python, Monty, I've had him for like four or five years now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he's Let's loaded. start with yeah. ball pythons. What a great transition. And with, and with Monty, if Monty were a child, he would be starting kindergarten soon. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Right. Uh, yeah, so let's let's dive into uh, ball pythons. What, what can you tell us about the ball python? Uh, ball pythons are really good snakes for beginners, I would say. Um, they, they're very tolerant of handling, so if you want to get a snake that you can hold, ball mm-hmm. pythons is the way to go, because a lot of other snakes, they won't necessarily bite you, which is a kind of misconception, right. but they'll want to like slither away and mm-hmm. stuff, but ball pythons just kind of like sit in your hands and they don't move a whole lot. But the only thing with ball pythons is they're a little bit more picky eaters, so mm-hmm. that's the only thing that some people like want to stray away from because they are picky. I see. Right. It, so do they have like a strictly rodent diet? Yeah, they oh, okay. have to eat mice or rats depending mm-hmm. on their size. Oh, okay. 
it, I'm assuming the larger then leads it to rats as yeah. opposed to smaller as mice. Because um, you were you were saying because uh, the, the this type of snake, uh, like you said, does not necessarily have venom in order to uh, get its prey down. These oh. are con- the constricting kind of snakes, yes. right? And then uh, what 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 else uh, would we want to know about either ball pythons themselves or about Monty in particular? <laughs> um, they're really cute. They have like little puppy faces, which mm-hmm. a lot of people don't see. People are afraid of snakes. I don't get it, <laughs> but they're just so cute and. Um, it's interesting because every reptile, every animal, I feel like has their own personality in a way. And a mm-hmm. lot of people don't see it like that. But if you like own a pet and you're taking really good care of it and giving it a lot of space and spending time with it, you kind of see a different personality in different animals, mm-hmm. even things like snakes. Now, full disclosure, I have watched a handful of your videos, one of which you introduced Monty. Mm-hmm. And when you were talking about ball pythons, you mentioned uh, that they come in different morphs. Yes. What's a morph? Um, morphs, it's pretty much different designs and, like, colors oh, okay. of ball pythons, and, it, it, like, it goes into, like, their genes, mm-hmm. and breeders kind of will breed ball pythons to have, like, cool designs or cooler colors and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Because, like, the conventional, I think, color that most people think of is, like, a, I don't want to say speckled, but, like, kind of, like, the the back of the python has, like, black and gray, and then it's uh, body is more of a brown color. Yeah, it's like brownish, yeah. Mm-hmm. But then, so like a different morph would be if it were like a white variant of Yeah, that. there's actually a ball python that's all white, and then there are ones that are like yellow or maybe even a little bit more pink, and then the designs are different mm-hmm. on them. So these these boys really uh, accessorize a bit. Right? Yeah. They're, they're like a little bit more fashion forward than I think like yeah. some of the snakes. It's like almost like a designer handbag in a way because mm-hmm. a lot of them, the expensive morphs, there are ball pythons out there that are like $10,000. Oh wow. Goodness. So if you get a normal ball python, you can get it for $20,000, $30, but mm-hmm. you can, it ranges from $100,000, $500,000, $1,000, all the way up to like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 just and- for a snake. And ball pythons are on the smaller spectrum of the python family, yeah? Uh, yeah, I would say so. There's definitely a lot bigger ones out there. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, reticulated <laughs> pythons, they get huge. Mm-hmm. Like, but how long can a python eventually get? Uh, uh, depending on, on what kind. It depends on what kind, but I would say, like, the really big ones, like reticulated pythons, I think they can get to be, like, maybe, like, 10 or 12 feet long. Depending. Yeah, you don't want to run Whoa. into that. Yeah, and, like, they get, like, this big around. Like, they can yeah. swallow, like, large rabbits and mm-hmm. stuff. Because so, yeah. isn't the... The snake in the jungle book, that's a, a type of python, right? Am I thinking of the right kind of one? That I don't know. Because I remember, yeah, like, sure. all I remember is Mo- like Mowgli, when uh, the snake tries to kill him, like, it, it, it's like, I'm going to just give you a nice hug. <laughs> and it's like, and they're like, oh no, no, run away, a that's cop, their whole thing. <laughs> yeah. also has, like, possessive power, like, like hypnotism powers, so yeah. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know if you should go off of that as, like, the, the staple for pythons. That was not a documentary I was watching? I am so sorry to inform you it was not. Oh no. Um, based on everything you've said, if we can jump into sorting, if that's all right, yeah. uh, I do I feel that um, ball pythons might be a Hufflepuff as far as as far as snakes go, because based on what you've said, that they're a little bit more mellow. Obviously, yeah. the picky eater thing might make them perhaps more of a Slytherin or a Gryffindor in nature, mm-hmm. but because um, it also tends to be um, more of a, a defense rather than an offense when it's like meeting somebody who would consider it to be its prey, right? Like yeah. I read, like it, it'll it'll do like a tucking maneuver. To mm-hmm. like just you know get its extremities out of the way. So yeah. I, I would definitely say that because Hufflepuffs, if they can avoid conflict, they're going to do that instead. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing with snakes is they definitely rather run away from you than try to attack you if they know that you're a lot bigger than it. Right. <laughs> so yeah, because snakes aren't dumb. <laughs> right. Uh, let's let's shift gears um, to what is another snake that you possess. Um, I have a red tail boa. A red tail boa. Oh. Yes. What is uh, what's what's your red tail boa's name first and foremost? Athena. Athena. Great. Yes. Um, birthed from the head of Zeus, I believe. Yeah, got a, a goddess of wisdom, <laughs> and uh, I think war. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, because those two things pair so well together. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all about strategy. I know. Um, so, so tell us more about this kind of snake. 
Well, boas are definitely a lot more moody, I would say, than ball pythons. More of a diva snake. Yeah, like, <laughs> sometimes they're not in a good mood and you just don't want to try to handle them because they, they, they won't necessarily bite you, but I've had my boa strike kind of, like, in my direction to try to scare me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's also because they're territorial of their enclosure, so if you open it up and you try to stick your hand in there, they don't like that, or they yeah. might associate it with being fed. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's definitely, like... You can tell if you open it up, like, if it kind of forms an S shape and it, like, looks like it's trying to, like, back away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, okay, I probably shouldn't get it out right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the uh, diet of, a, of this type of snake? Um, well, most snakes just eat, like, you know, mammals, like mm -hmm. rodents. So, uh, Colombian boas... Which, which is the type of red tail boa. It's a Colombian red tail boa. Mm -hmm. um, they eat mainly like rats because they are bigger than ball pythons. So they'll eat like large rats. And if you have like a really, really big red tail boa, then you might even need to start feeding it rabbits. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then at that point, the number of pets that you have fluctuates day by day. If I have, you know, 42, now I have 41. <laughs> the is very happy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, am I, um, I'm, am I remembering correctly that this is the kind of snake, uh, the, the kind of snake that will have, uh, like that sort of stuff, uh, affecting their eyes? So like, doesn't this breed see a little bit less well than some other ones? Um. Or like have eye problems more easily? I'm not sure about those ones particularly, yeah. but snakes in general don't have very good sight. They, oh, okay, maybe that's what I was they mainly, <laughs> Yeah, they mainly rely on their smell, and they have, a lot of them have, like, heat receptors on their face, oh, wow. so they can detect, like, heat. Mm -hmm. So it's, oh. it's also cool, because a lot of the times, if I'm, like, near the enclosure, sometimes they'll, like, kind of start to go towards the door, because they can sense heat, and they think that maybe it's, like, food. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, are these, uh, how, how long is a red tail boa approximately? Um, it depends, male and female, because oh, okay. females do get longer. I would mm -hmm. say a female Colombian red tail boa could probably get to be like six or seven feet long, mm -hmm. whereas a male probably just be a little bit smaller, like five or six feet, I would say. So then, is Athena a female and so six or seven feet long? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're able to, I mean, really wear her like a boa yeah <laughs> like that's what what uh and i'm assuming based on the fact that they're called a red tail they have a red coloration to them yeah it's like a kind <laughs> of like a dark kind of like burgundy almost Ooh, red yeah okay. and that's a any patterns or anything like that um they're kind of like the brownish color and they have like speckles around them and they have a little bit of pattern but not it's not like too crazy i would say okay um shifting to sorting yeah, I would say, like, this is probably more, uh, because, uh, they don't necessarily, uh, live in, like, they try, they, they like to live by themselves, right? Yeah. And, you know, they can be a little bit more on the finicky side, mm -hmm. a little more of a diva, like I said. I'm gonna probably say Slytherin on this one. That's, that's <laughs> totally fair, and it, I mean, it'd be fitting for most of our snakes to be leaning into Slytherin just based on house, like, But I'm yeah. not gonna be prejudiced like that. I appreciate that. You've grown so much in the years that we've I been can, doing this. I can grow. I... I appreciate that. <laughs> this character arc is getting really nuanced. Um, what uh, What is our next snake that we should be diving on into? Yeah. Um, well, I have a sunbeam snake. A sunbeam snake. Yeah. Okay. What uh, What's the sunbeam snake's name? Uh, Opal. Great. Opal. You have, you're a good namer. Thank Some you. Some people are not good namers. A I'm lot like, of people. Boris. Yeah. A lot of people <laughs> like ask me where I get names from, and I'm like, I don't know. I just look them up and find cool ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the right thing to do, as opposed to, like it really bums me out when a dog or like any animal has a human name. I'm like, don't name a dog Charlie. That's just <laughs> weird. Yeah. All right. I think I feel like you're coming for me. I have a cat named Sylvia. Right, but you, but. Sylvia, don't you call Sylvia something different? I just call her Sylvie. It's just another human name. I suppose that's true. <laughs> uh, so, so tell us more about a sun. That wasn't sunbeam. meant to be a subtweet. I apologize. <laughs> subtweet? How loud? <laughs> you dork. Hey, man. Whatever. All right. So uh, let's talk sunbeam snakes. Yeah. So sunbeams, they actually don't really have a design. They're pretty much all gray, or some of them are even like closer to like black or just really mm -hmm. dark gray. But it's, they're actually one of the prettiest snakes, in my opinion, because in sunlight, you can see, like, an iridescent, like, shimmer on their scales. And that's where you got, like, the, the opal idea. Yeah, because yeah. when I first got it, it was, like, light gray because it was going into shed, mm -hmm. and it almost looked like 
opal with the iridescence and everything. Mm -hmm. I see. How frequently, and this might just be like a general snake question, so I apologize for taking us like back out. No, it's fine. Um, How frequently do snakes shed and does it vary just species to species, genus to genus? Um, It does vary and it also depends on the age of the snake because in the snake's first couple years of life, it grows pretty quickly. And then once it kind of stops growing or slows down a lot it won't shed as often because Mm -hmm. when they're shedding it's because they're outgrowing their skin but once they kind of reach like pretty much their final size they don't shed very often like maybe once every like couple months or something some snakes even less frequently like i remember like how awkward it felt like when you're like when you're growing and you're getting like growing pains uh Mm -hmm. from like when you like shoot up a little bit imagine like if you're like Oh no, I'm growing again. And then you just like hulked out of your own skin in yeah, order to do it. That's literally that's what they do. Such a, way more awkward adolescence <laughs> than we have to go to through. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then um, uh, with sunbeam snakes, uh, what are are their feeding patterns similar to, of just like rodents and uh, other mammals, or is there like a more? It's exception? mainly just yeah. I feed mine just mice and just mice. Yeah. Um, do they? Uh, what, what's the size on a... Uh, they actually stay pretty small compared to, like, ball pythons and the red-tailed boa. Uh, as far as length goes, mm-hmm. they might be around, like, four, three or four feet long, but they stay, like, pretty small around. Like, they'll just eat, like, medium-sized mice maybe pretty much their entire life. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as climate goes for them, uh, do they have a preference... Like, what's their preferential climate? Very humid. Very humid. Yeah, like almost like 90 to 100 percent humidity at all times uh and is that a, a based off of both bull pythons and red tail boas i'm assuming that is like not what they no uh yeah it's definitely a lot higher for okay. the sunbeam snake so sunbeam snakes really like their moisture yeah and they what they do is they actually burrow into the ground mm-hmm. and then they'll like kind of stick their head out of the ground and wait for something to come and then they'll go and get it and they'll just kind of hide back into the ground so they kind of like stay in a really moist Mm-hmm. area just like under the dirt oh gotcha yeah uh, and this this kind of snake is probably not like not like uh the 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 first boa you were telling us about that's like pretty easy to handle good for a first time owner maybe this is probably more of like an advanced one because i heard like this one yeah. like they can it's not even necessarily that they're temperamental but that they can just get sick and die more easily from yeah. being handled right yeah they get very stressed out from handling and Aww. um like, they aren't really aggressive, I would say, because I've never had mine strike at me or bite me or anything, but what they can do is they musk, where they kind of, like, it's almost like they're peeing, like, this really smelly liquid on mm-hmm. you. Yeah, and that's where the and... word that comes from, like, perfumes and stuff comes from. Oh. I think it comes from, like, the animal term for musk. Yeah, yeah, so they'll actually do that as a defense mechanism. Oh, wow. But I've never had that happen, thankfully, either. Yeah, so... <laughs> well, you probably know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, well, the key is to not handle them if you don't have to. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then we've met mentioned sort of the region at least with the Colombian red tail boa where do sunbeam snakes hail from um i can't remember exactly where but i believe it's like somewhere in asia i want to say like I, the more mi- southeast part of asia I, oh okay. yeah i think so whereas okay. like uh the, the 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 other boas i think both the other ones are african snakes right yeah yeah so like yeah you're but most of these are going to come from like, there aren't too many... Are there many New World constrictors, or is it mostly Africa and Asia that you would find those? Do you know? Um, I would say it's mainly, like... I mean, the most popular ones are, like, boas and ball pythons. Yeah. Those are the most popular ones. But when you start getting into things like sunbeam snakes, it's a lot harder to find because they're just yeah. not popular in the pet trade. <laughs> right. Gotcha. So then you had to, like, get them at, a, like, a specialty uh, reptile expo or something? Yeah, I went to a reptile expo. I'm from Michigan, but I actually got it at an expo in Pittsburgh. So. Gotcha. So you yeah. were, like, I am getting myself a sunbeam yeah. snake, and you made the drive. Yeah, and it was crazy because when I went to Pittsburgh, the expo there was, like, completely different from the ones in Michigan because in Michigan they don't allow, like, highly venomous animals at all but at the one in Pittsburgh they Anything had like goes. they had like cobras vipers rattlesnakes Whoa. like all kinds of stuff do you have any of those I don't are no. you looking snakes. into getting any I really want a viper which sounds absolutely insane but, <laughs> but I don't have experience handling venomous things and like yeah, I don't like, really want to die like that badly right 
And so. vipers, um, <laughs> and we don't necessarily need to sort vipers if they're out of your knowledge base. Uh, but vipers, don't they have that like unique way of moving where they? Yeah, it's weird. They're, they're moving like an S shape. Yeah, they're like the most snaky of snakes yeah. when people initially think of them. Yeah, well, there's actually a snake. It's called a hognose snake, and those are pretty popular in the pet trade, and you can find them at expos pretty easily. And they are technically venomous, yeah, but they aren't like venomous enough that it's gonna like really do anything if they bit you. But mm -hmm. it's more like when they attack smaller animals, like small mice, it helps them. But they move in like that same really weird way, like the vipers do. Mm -hmm. So, do you know more about the hognose snake? As we've just like walked <laughs> onto this one. Well, I haven't actually owned one, but yeah. I have friends who own them, and I've been kind of like looking into getting one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, how how long does a hognose snake get? They stay pretty small. I want to say maybe like three feet long. Oh, maybe. okay. Like they don't get big at all. So they're a, a more manageable one, but not one that you'd recommend necessarily, obviously for beginners because they have venom. Well, they they could still be good for beginners because they stay small. Not everyone wants to get a snake that's going to be four or five feet long. And right. <laughs> like I said, the venom, the venom won't actually like hurt you if they bite you. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're one of the snakes where I feel like Getting them to bite you is kind of difficult. You'd really have to kind of piss it off. For it oh, to... so they're on the more mellow side, like a ball python. Not, I wouldn't say ball python level. Ball pythons are special where, yeah. like, they just <laughs> don't <chill>. care. <laughs> but, like, if you're going to handle it and you, like, know what you're doing and it's, like, your snake's in a good mood, then you should be fine. Um, out of curiosity, for the ones that are venomous, like, uh, and are, like, I... Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it turns into like I will bite you. <laughs> yeah. Do, do they usually like have to do like a, a process of like do they like, milk the venom out like every once in a while to make sure that like they can't if they do bite you that they can't poison you or are you kind of just like I'll just I'll just learn how to deal with it and not get bitten. Is um. It, yeah. Like, most people who own venomous snakes or reptiles in general, they they just have the venom and. You have, just have to be very careful. Gotcha. So you just have your anti venom around. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of times, times, if you're gonna like open the enclosure or whatever, you need to have someone with you. So yeah. if something happens, they can like call an ambulance or something. Right. right. <laughs> Is there a way? And forgive me if I'm wildly off base. I tend to be. Um, is is there a procedure that can remove because they have venom sacs, right? In in a snake's mouth or something um, like that. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Oh, like, I just wasn't sure if there's I, like a I, surgery it, that it can might. Be... Yeah, and that's what I was going for because like usually I'm like, I think if they... you're gonna own an animal that you have to like give like mutilate their bodies to do it. Well, it's... yeah, I think they get they can get defanged. Mm. Yeah, but I think it's mainly frowned upon to do that. Right. That, I no, was thinking it... there must be like a huge humane there some, argument there's some ethical it. Yeah. things too it kind of it's like the equivalent of like declawing a cat because mm -hmm. you're not only like it's to maybe like convenience you that you won't get bitten and die but you're probably affecting their equilibrium in some part I have to imagine like you yeah. do with a cat their balance it can make them sick right and it's just in general it's like yeah you're doing damage to them to so they can't do damage to you. Yeah, well, what some people do, too, is, um, I don't know, remember where exactly they were, they were doing this, but with rattlesnakes, they'll actually sew their mouths shut. What? So that people it's can hold them, up. and they can't bite them. And That's... people will, like, take pictures with the snake with its mouth sewn shut and stuff like that, and... Like, it's awful. Yeah, they, they do that with, like, alligators, too. Well, they don't sew them shut, but they'll, like, tape the mouths shut so they right. can't yeah. open them and stuff. That's really problematic. No, yeah. it's, it's basically saying, I want to have control of something... That yeah, it has you know because rattlesnakes and I I can't I lived uh, in in the southwest and in Phoenix and, and the Joshua Tree area they're just everywhere yeah and rattlesnakes if you go into their area they will they'll, they'll fuck you up <laughs> I, yeah I almost stepped on one when I was hiking once as like an Ooh, eight year old really? uh, I'm yeah. glad you didn't so that we can be here today I am too podcast. but it was definitely yeah. a situation I've had like multiple I was hiking and I almost. Like, X, Y, Z, I've almost run into a grizzly bear, I've almost walked into the back of a moose, and I almost stepped on a... I just need to be paying attention more, because I just get, like, so... Just like, I'm in nature, this yes, is fantastic! Yeah. And I get so lost, and then suddenly I, like, am, I wasn't looking at my feet, and I, like, almost stepped, and it was just, like, reared up. Yeah. And I just was like, and I walk backwards now, and was fine, yeah. thankfully. Do you, uh, do you uh, happen to own any snakes that are not constrictors that might be classified as different ones, or is that usually the kind that... Pretty much all of mine are constrictors, okay. yeah. Okay. So like, let me just move on to like a different kind of... Uh, uh, reptile. Uh, yeah, of the reptiles. Uh, what, 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 what was your first, uh, and maybe like that you still have, of like uh, lizards and stuff? 
Uh, the first, well, the first lizard, like I said, I ever got was yeah, the leopard gecko. Right. Yeah. But other than that, the first one I got was a bearded dragon. Ooh. Yeah, and those are like super, super common. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're really good beginner ones, and they're <laughs> they're really cool because like they tolerate being handled very well. Like they'll kind of just sit in your hand, and like sometimes they'll try to like run or whatever. But like they are not very aggressive at all unless you know they were like mishandled as when they were younger, and sometimes yeah. then it can cause issues. Right, and but their yeah. diet, I mean, across most reptiles is just going to be your crickets or mealworms. Yeah, a lot of reptiles, especially, like, geckos mainly will eat, like, insects, but some also will eat fruits and vegetables as well, oh. and bearded dragons are actually one of those where they eat fruits and vegetables and insects. That's <laughs> awesome. So they're they're looking for, like, a slightly more eclectic diet. Yeah, I guess they're more opportunistic in that way, where <laughs> if they can find insects, they'll eat them, but then if they can just find, like, fruits and veggies, they'll eat mm-hmm. those. Uh, how big does a bearded dragon get? From, like, their head to the tip of their tail, they can get to be, like, a foot long, probably, maybe a little bit longer than that. It depends. Some bearded dragons just get bigger than other mm-hmm. ones. Oh, and where are my manners? What's the name of your bearded dragon? <laughs> Malachi. Malachi. <laughs> Again, yeah. awesome name. I actually didn't name Malachi, though. I... Over there. But, um, yeah, Malachi, I was actually his, like, third or fourth owner, I want to say. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's been rehomed a few times, but I didn't name him, so... Well, <laughs> still a good name. Like, living up to just the, the tradition of good names yeah. at home. Yeah. Uh, so how, how would you, um, for instance, know, like, uh, when, when a, a bearded dragon's mad at you? <laughs> when they're mad, the, the reason why they're called bearded dragons is they have, like, kind of, like, a spiky beard, mm-hmm. and it kind of, like, puffs out, and then it'll turn black if they're Whoa. really pissed off. It changes colors? Yeah, it'll, like, turn, like, like really a mood dark. Ring. I, knew, I knew about the puff-up, but I had no idea that it would actually, like... It, what causes it to... Ch- Do you know what causes it to change colors? Um, I, like, I don't know the exact, like, scientific reason, but I guess yeah. they just try to make themselves look very intimidating, and that's how they do it. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, something changing colors would inha- just instinctively yeah. make me go, oh, no, that's, any, yeah, that's problematic. Any any stark color change is usually <laughs> like a watch out sort mm-hmm. of siren for, <laughs> for anyone around Nature's them. Nature's so <laughs> cool like that. that yeah. They're yeah. like, oh, we've got plumage that like shows up when suddenly we're trying to fend you off or we yeah. puff up it's or all, all that. It's all about trying to communicate with another species yeah. <laughs> with the best shorthand possible. <laughs> yeah, and colors are the greatest of shorthand. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to imagine that maybe a bearded dragon and any other lizard's not going to make, be as an affection as like a dog, but no. like, is there any other way that they express their personalities? Um, I mean, they have different personalities. Yeah. Like, mine is just really weird. Like, it'll, it, the way it runs around its enclosure, and, like, it'll sleep with its hands up against the glass, and it's, like, looking out at you, and it just falls asleep like that, <laughs> and it's, like, so weird. It sounds like, it sounds like somebody, like, a, a kid who's really nosy all the time, yeah. to the point that it's, like, I'll just take a nap while keeping an eye on everything. Yeah, <laughs> and, like, I can tell when he's, like, pacing that he, like, wants to get out, so then I'll take him out and let him run around my room, and he'll usually, like, run to the window and just sit up, sit by the window. And, like, <laughs> See, he's trying, he's like, I gotta keep on everything. You have <laughs> yeah. a busy body compared to Dragon <laughs> <Right>. there. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, Malachi, mind your own beeswax. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, do you have a, a direction that you're leaning as far as sorting goes, Reed? Hmm. I would say because like, like they're they're more they're they're gonna be more aggressive instead of like uh, say like you know just kind of like you know back off when other people like go into their territory and stuff like that right yeah I wouldn't say they back off necessarily yeah. I mean it probably depends on the specific individual sure but... I know they they do size each other up when they they like they, they sort of like yeah. who's in charge here yeah some <laughs> yeah. of them are just very like territorial and they want to be dominant mm-hmm. so they really do express that like but yeah since they're since they're more on the friendly side like you said like if you're like maybe a beginner reptile owner it's not like a terrible choice I'd say maybe yeah. Gryffindor yeah that's yeah, kind of where I was easy to make well. friends but they they can be like there's like a slight temperamentality yeah. <laughs> <to them. laughs> and yeah. the nosiness from Malachi in general yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so then, uh, what other lizards do you possess? Yeah, what's uh, another cool one you, you want people to know about? Another really cool one is my blue tongue skink. Ooh. Just yeah. by the name. J- yeah, just by the name. <laughs> yeah. What's this blue tongue skink's name? Uh, my blue tongue skink is Castor. <laughs> I'm, like, so impressed by your name. <laughs> well, when you have 40, you have to start getting creative. <laughs> yeah, you run out of the boring ones eventually. Uh, 
what can you tell us about blue tongued skinks? They have blue tongues, in case wow. you can I tell. I would never have guessed. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they actually, a lot of people think they look a lot like snakes because they have a long body and they have these really tiny, pathetic legs that, like, <laughs> they can just, like, barely, like, it looks like they're struggling to move around. But, like, the way they move, it almost looks like they're, like, slithering because they kind of, like, it almost looks like it, but they're just kind of, like, pulling their bodies with their So they're small, the wiener legs. dogs of lizards. Yeah, that's yeah, actually like, a really good way to put it. Yeah, if you're looking at it, it's kind of, like, very stunted. The shoulders are, like, less pronounced than you would see on, like, another sort of reptile. And, it's, it, it, and this, even the head, it, like, some varieties, it it's goes into that more, like, tear dot, uh, drop shape instead oh, of, yeah. like... Uh, whereas, like, the bearded dragon has a very specific uh, head shape. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. And uh, so, uh, how long do these these guys tend to live? Um, yeah, it just depends. I mean, I would say they could live maybe, like, 10, 15, 20 years. But obviously, some of them will die younger. It just depends. Just based on environment and yeah. things like that. And these, are these also uh, fruit and veggie eaters? or Yes, they, they eat, like, they'll find, like, dead animals in the wild and, like, eat them. And they'll eat fruits, vegetables, whatever they oh, can so, find. So they'll also eat mammals if they come upon them? or Yeah. Oh, like, okay, so these guys are, like, the omnivores of omnivores. Yeah, what's actually really really cool is you can feed blue tongue skinks dog food like wet dog food and that's actually like really common to do because mm -hmm. their diet is almost similar in that way to dogs where they eat oh. like kind of like meats a lot and then also like fruits and vegetables my comparison to a wiener dog is becoming more apt yeah. by the minute <laughs> yeah and yeah so they eat dog food but i also feed mine like i'll feed it some raw meat as well and then uh greens and fruits and stuff like that. Well, you, your skink has a better uh, diet probably than my cats do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and um, I, I also thought it was interesting, like, whereas some of the snakes that we talked about before might uh, be more of, like, nocturnal, or they're, they're going to go into their hunting uh, when it's advantageous. Like, these are actually, like, they're, they're like, diurnal, I think it's called, where, like, yeah. you, you'll be awake during the day or the night. Uh, yeah, diurnal, yeah. Yeah. They, they, it's mainly awake, I, I would say, during the day is when okay, it's cool. most active. Okay, Yeah. <laughs> Probably since that's, like, when you're awake to feed it and Well, stuff. and when yeah. there's heat, just yeah. in general. Yeah, because they like to come out and bask in the sunlight. Gotcha. And is there anything else that we should know, like, maybe about their personality or, like, about yours in general? Uh, they're uh, really, like, they, they are very easygoing for the most part. And, and the reason why I say that is because sometimes they're wild caught, which is bad. But obviously, like, wild caught animals aren't used to human interaction. But if right. you get one that's captive bred, then you can really get it used to handling. And they're just, like, really cool and, like, chill. Um, the only thing that sucks is their nails get really sharp. So mm -hmm. you have to, like, trim back their nails. Otherwise, you have, like, scratches all over your hands. Oh, man. But other than that, like, they don't, they won't they're bite not, you. They're not terribly aggressive or anything. No, not like at that. all. <laughs> I'm I'm leaning Hufflepuff on this. Oh, oh, oh. also, what I oh, want to mention. Ooh. Sorry to no, 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 no. But um, is the reason why they have blue tongues is because that's like the, their defense mechanism is when they get like stressed out or they feel like something's gonna attack it, they'll stick out their blue tongue, at just to try to scare things because I guess things will think it might be venomous because of the blue tongue. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't see that color in nature often. Yeah, so that's like its defense mechanism. Oh, you know something really interesting, and I wonder if this is like intentional because he would do this all the time. Uh, Roald Dahl, uh, the guy who wrote like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, mm -hmm. uh, he had another book called The Witches. Yes. And in the book, um, not in the movie version, in the book, they actually talked about a way you could tell who was a witch and who was like a, just a normal woman is the witches, uh, the, when they got upset, they their tongues were blue. Oh really? Isn't that interesting? I wonder if they if yeah. he was gonna, if, like he took that from nature about like about certain animals like. I mean, Roald Dahl pulled from all over the place, <laughs> creating wild things. So yeah. who knows? Yeah, I would say it's. it's a I, agree, I agree with you. It, this is probably a Hufflepuff because what a Hufflepuff move to be like I gotta be aggressive, just stick yeah. their tongue at you. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I always wonder, like how do they even survive in the wilds, like without being protected at all times? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's the part of me that actually, based on the blue tongue thing, I was thinking maybe that's actually a Ravenclaw, like move oh, really? of of like assessing the situation, also like taking into consideration like the uh, uh, omnivore tendencies to just be like, okay, well, like I can't be picky. I need to understand like anything is acceptable. Yeah. Um, and then the blue tongue angle of just, like, this is a thing that's not seen in nature. So statistically speaking, if this shows up, like, nobody's going to futz with me. Yeah. No um, argument there. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not necessarily, like, married to it being a Ravenclaw. Sure. It could be a Hufflepuff. We don't need to land on anything. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, maybe. Uh, do you do you have uh, many amphibians at all? Yeah. Um, amphibians are not reptiles, Reed. Oh, are we only doing reptiles? We are only doing Listen, reptiles. I this is for you, the ease of the podcast. My stupid, my stupidity has no limits. <laughs> it That's is the first thing you have to understand. It is all right, but uh, yeah, is there is there any other reptile that you might possess, and we can? Um, yeah, I mean, I also have abronias. What are abronias? Those are people who really like the show My Little Pony. <laughs> oh. You get on the internet, Michael. Like, well, Very close. Oh, no, I'm wrong. But... <laughs> well, no, what, are, what are they in actuality? Well, they're like, they're also called Mexican alligator lizards. There's different kinds, but they're like really cool looking. They almost look like little alligators, which is why they're called alligator lizards. Gotcha. Yeah. But they're like these little greenish, almost teal colored lizards, and they have like Ooh. really prominent scales and long tails. Mm-hmm. And they live in Mexico up high in the trees in a humid climate. And it sucks because they're actually like kind of endangered because we're destroying their environment. But bringing them into the pet trade is helping preserve them as a species because people yeah. are starting to breed them in captivity. Do you know of any... Because we, we actually did a uh, marine mammals episode with a, a zoology uh, educator and she was like... We were talking about the Vasquez por- porpoises, which there are like only 12 of left. Do you happen to know any... Uh, like ways to be helping these what they're abronias 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 or is this more like deforestation and stuff like that it's mostly deforestation but also some people in like smaller villages in Mexico who just don't know much about them think that they're venomous because they just look really kind of intimidating Mm -hmm. so people will like actually go out of their way to kill them because they are afraid of them so if you're in Mexico and you see these cute little guys running about they aren't gonna hurt you yeah they're harmless (laughs) um so they're how like do, do they vary in size based on male female as has previously been sort of um, stated or is it just like I, maybe like the size of their head and the shape you can kind of tell at least with mine I can tell the difference between the male and the female but I would say they stay pretty much around the same size and what are their names uh, Jupiter and Juno great yeah <laughs> All right, so we got we got some mytho- more mythology going on. Yeah. There. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, diet is fairly consistent. Yeah, they, since, they, since they're on the smaller side, they're probably mealworms and grasshoppers, or well, they mainly eat insects. Yeah, uh, people would usually feed them crickets, or mm-hmm. I feed mine like really small dubia roaches because, oh. like I said before, I had a colony of them. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what I feed most of my reptiles that eat insects. Mm-hmm. Is that why you uh, got into? Um to uh, uh, raising uh, those kind of cockroaches so she like I can have my own sustainable food yeah supply. cockroaches are a lot easier to breed and have a colony of than crickets are and they're also healthier for the reptiles and they don't smell as bad and they're easier to feed and they're like slower so they're just overall better than crickets I, I get I think cockroaches get a pretty bad rap they, yeah, because they yeah they are a little they're very scary but <laughs> they're in my opinion they're kind of like like cattle, like they're kind of like the cow of the insect world. Yeah. Like, you know, they're 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 pretty friendly. At least it's slow moving. <laughs> yeah, they're, well, they're like roly polies. People like those. But, yeah, but they're just a bigger. <laughs> they just don't have as cute of a name as roly poly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all branding and PR. I I, I, yeah. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get on that rebranding of yeah. cockroaches. Make make the make them more appealing. In not just they'll survive a nuclear blast, <laughs> yeah, because that's like a weird selling point for anything, right? Yeah. And then uh, for uh, you said Jupiter and Juno, yeah, uh, do they do they stay in t- together in the same enclosure or do they chill out in their own places? Yeah, they stay in the same enclosure because they're male and female, and yeah. with the Bronias, they'll pair up as a male and female. So with other species, a lot of the times it's not good, obviously, to keep males together because right. males they'll you know, fight, yeah. yeah. And, I mean, sometimes it's okay to keep females together, but it's not always okay to keep male and female. But with the Bronias, they're just happier in that kind of pair. They like to be pair, like, pair bonded. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, like, what's their dynamic together? Like, how do they interact with each other? Um, well, I don't see them, like, being active too much. Usually when I look in there, there's a plant in there because all the plants I have in there thing is they're alive they're real plants Mm -hmm. so they have one that specifically that they like lay on top of each other and it's like really cute (laughs) Hufflepuff probably yeah that's really cute they're cuddling (laughs) cuddling lizards for sure (laughs) overall very harmless and they're cute Uh, do you have another lizard yeah like Uh, let's do one more I think and before yeah, we... I have crusted geckos. All right, let's yeah. close out with crusted geckos. Well, you gotta get geckos. a gecko. <laughs> yeah, I have crusted geckos, and these guys are really easy to take care of because they, a lot of reptiles, they need heat sources, but mm-hmm. crusted geckos, it depends on the temperature of your house, but they can live in, like, 
around like lower 70s to the 80s so a lot of the times if you keep your house warmer you mm-hmm. can just keep them in room temperature and they're like really friendly some of them are a little bit moody like mine sometimes if i grab them they'll try to bite me but once i have them out and everything they kind of mellow out a little yeah. bit <laughs> but yeah and then as far as their diet goes they eat like kind of i think in the wild they eat like fruits and stuff a lot but they also will eat insects mm-hmm. but in captivity people buy like a gecko diet and it comes in a powder form and you mix it with water to make kind of like a thick kind of like consistency and they kind oh. of like eat it and then so you they also just enjoy this paste yeah it's, it's kind like of a like the, thing. they're like uh, of all the lizards they're like i'm on soylent i'm on a, i'm on the soylent diet it's you almost enjoy? it's like a smoothie almost <laughs> yeah it's so interesting yeah. so and then just like a couple times a week i give them insects as well for the mm-hmm. variety uh, where do uh, crusted geckos come from? Are you they... say crusted? Did I... <laughs> I'm like not a hundred percent sure. I want to say they're probably from like South America somewhere because they live in like a humid kind of like tropical climate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see here. Um, do, do, do. I might be completely wrong though. Out in the, I'm I'm seeing uh, out. I believe in the South Pacific. Okay. And, and then from when my brief reading here. Uh, an interesting thing here is uh, people for a while thought this this type of uh, gecko was extinct. Oh, yeah, like they thought like they just hadn't oh. they just couldn't find it for a little while. And apparently, in 1994, there was like an expedition by this by, by this researcher, and they actually went out and like they're like, oh no, we found them, and then what? like they helped to like I didn't know that. It. Yeah, That's really it, weird. Isn't that interesting? It's just like just thinking like there are animals that we are, under our assumption are extinct, but they just might have been yeah. like. That's weird because I feel like that's recently, like N- like ninety four. Cool. Yeah, and now they're like one of the most common reptiles you can keep as a pet. Like wow. when you go to uh, expo, like there's tons of crested geckos everywhere. Yeah. And where are your? Uh, what's the name of your crested gecko? Uh, I have two. One is Luna, and then the other one's Lance. I had to think for a second. <laughs> Whenever people ask me my pet names, I need to, like go through the list and be like, Wait right. A Honestly, that there are people who have like three or four kids. Yeah. And like I don't. <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> you have so. 40 kids. Yeah. <laughs> you have to remember everyone's <laughs> name. So <laughs> I would not be able to. <laughs> so uh, with a crested gecko, um, how, like, uh, are they standard gecko size? I, standard gecko? <laughs> I, I realize I'm like, I don't have a metric for The gecko measurement size. of gecko. Yeah, <laughs> how many I mean, geckos is it? <laughs> ge- geckos, I would say they're one of the smaller ones because there are geckos that get pretty big. Right. I mean, I'd say that maybe they're more like a medium-sized gecko. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's interesting about them is, well, a lot of geckos, they drop their tails as mm-hmm. a defense mechanism and they'll regenerate them. But crested geckos actually don't regenerate their tails. So mm-hmm. once they drop it, they just kind of have like a stub. Mm-hmm. Oh. So, and I actually prefer the way they look with a stub better than with a tail. I think it's like really cute looking. So both of mine, when I got them, they didn't have tails already. Mm-hmm. And I'm also always afraid that I'm going to freak them out and they're going to drop their tail while I'm like handling them. Oh, so. you, you would not want to have to deal with the guilt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they do grow back, right? They No, they're, the crested, they're, no. The crested geckos, their tails don't grow it's back. Kind of like, they, don't. they kind of become like a corgi. Yeah, I it's like see. a little stub. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're wow. the corgis of, of lizards once are they there, drop it. Are there lots of lizards that when they lose their tail they don't grow back or is... i would say most of them they regenerate their tails yeah but crested geckos don't that's such that's really interesting i can't yeah. fathom like being so scared that like my arm falls off and then be yeah. like don't worry i'll come back later <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> don't you startle me ever again though and it's arm. creepy because when they drop them they're still like wiggling around to like try and yeah. you know distract whatever they're trying to get away from right which so, is yeah. that smart. <laughs> yeah. That's some smart biology right, right. there. Um, so how are we feeling as far as sorting her? Are there other questions that you might have about these geckos? Um, in general, like, uh, do they, they tend to be, like, pretty... Like, they're pretty friendly. Yeah, they're friendly because you said they're, they're, they're one of the easier ones to have. And then, yeah. So, uh, in particular, your, yours, like, uh, what are their personalities like? Um, for the most part, they're pretty friendly. Like, I would say they tolerate handling for the most part, but the only thing is a lot of times when you're holding them, they tend to want to, like, jump off of you. <laughs> so they're so, a little adventurous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they like to, like, jump around and stuff, so if you're holding it, you need, need to just make sure it's kind of, like, close to a surface so they're not, like, jumping to their death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because that reminds me of, like, you know, like, Harry Potter, 
usually would like, like I want to go do this and then jump without thinking about right. it. Right. So I'd probably put it in a Gryffindor. I, I saw I saw where that <laughs> lean was headed. That was very good. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Tyler Ruggy, for joining us on this episode of The Sorting Hat. Yeah, no uh, problem. <laughs> if uh, we would like to be finding more of you, uh, whereabouts on the internet might we search? All right, I'm on YouTube, just Ooh. under my name, Tyler Ruggy, and I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. And worth noting, Ruggy is spelled R-U-G-G-E. Yes. Yeah, and we'll, we'll link you to it, That's obviously. Yes. Um, did you did you happen to bring any animals with you? I did not. Okay. No. You're not gonna yeah. be like you're, you're not gonna be like the guy on like Conan who comes in with like five lizards. Like here right. we go. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to stress them out, but also just bringing them would stress me out so much because I'd be sure. so worried about them the entire time I'm here. So I just didn't. Uh, they're just better off. At Let home. alone like. Uh, like, I would be stressed out trying to bring a small dog on a plane, let alone, like, here's my crusted gecko. Yeah. He'll right. need his own seat. Thank you. I like you. my snake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so definitely check out uh, Tyler's channel if you want more as far as, like, education or you're interested in more exotic pets because he has a whole litany of them. And they all <laughs> seem, like, very, very cool. Yeah. Um, if you'd like to be following more of myself or Reed, you can follow us at Belated Media or that Dang Dingus, respectively. Uh, thank you again so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And have a fantastic time, listeners. Okay, bye. 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 <laughs>